Hi, my name is Jonathan. <clears throat> Welcome to the Haystack. Uh, this week, we have two Bishvat. Now that starts on the evening of January 24th over into uh, sundown of January 25th. So that would be uh, Wednesday and Thursday this week. For me, that's going to be tomorrow. Um, two bit Shavat, what that is, is the 15th of the month of the Jewish month of Shavat. Um, so it's one of the four new years of the years that the Jews recognize. Um, modern day, they kind of look at it as a, uh, almost like an earth day. Um, it's remembered in scripture for, uh, Hey, don't cut down the trees when you destroy it. People, you know, leave the trees and the fruit thereof and all that. Um, but I wanted to read and find out what, what the purpose of a new year of trees really is. And, and is it even still relevant to us? And I found some very interesting things. So first I actually want to start off with biblical tithes. Um, Oriah, which is uh, the prohibition on Orla fruit, is a command found in the Bible to not eat fruit produced by a tree during its first three years. All right, so we're going to go over that. So Oriah, or Orla, sorry, refers to a biblical prohibition in Leviticus 19.23 on eating the fruit of the trees produced during the first three years after they are planted. It's on that fourth year when you take that fourth year of produce, of fruits, which are born, and you offer them up as a tithe. Um, and then you don't eat from that tree until up to the fifth year. The second tithe was the tithe which was collected in Jerusalem, and the poor tithe was a tithe given to the poor, Deuteronomy 14, 22 through 29, which were, uh, which were also calculated by the fruit ripened before or after Tupit Shvat. All right, so... A tithe is one-tenth, and it's one-tenth of these fruits that are being offered up. Uh, the poor tithe, uh, something you see in the scriptures is Jesus Christ walking through, and they're picking, you know, grapes or figs uh, without any thought of whose property is. It's, it's kind of like Samwise Gamgee just going through somebody's farm and picking up their mushrooms and carrots. Those hobbits were, were stealing. In Israel, they actually set aside uh, stuff for poor to, to be able to pick uh, people who are uh, uh, ministers, rabbis, teachers, people who are not earning a living from uh, through priestcraft, you know, or from any other way. This is a way for the surplus of the fruits to be shared with one another. Not only that, but they actually pick for the poor. They allow the poor to harvest themselves. Um, so I think that's very unique. Now, again, this is the first three years for a new tree. You don't pick that. The fourth, you pick it up for an offering. And after that, it's used as normal. Of the Talmudic requirements, Talmud being Old Testament for the Jews, uh, requirements for the trees, which used Tubit Shvat as the cutoff date in the Hebrew calendar for calculating the age of fruit-bearing tree, uh, the Oriah or the Orla remains to this day in essentially the same form it had in Talmudic times. In the Orthodox Jewish world, these practices are still observed today as part of halakha, uh, Jewish law. Fruit that ripened on the three-year-old tree before two bit shvat is considered orla and is forbidden to eat. While fruit ripening on or after two bit shvat of the tree's third year is permitted. In the first, second, fourth, and fifth years of the Shemitah cycle, and again, the Shemitah cycle is a Sabbath year, also called a sabbatical year. Um, the Sabbath of the land is the seventh year of the seventh year agricultural cycle mandated by the Torah in the land of Israel and is observed in Judaism. The second tithe is observed today by a ceremony redeeming tithing obligations um, with a coin. In the third and sixth years, the poor tithe is substituted and no coin is needed for redeeming it. Tubit Shvat is the cutoff date for redeeming, uh, for determining to which year the tithings belong. All right, so why, why did I tell you all of this? Well, I, I was curious about the symbolic meanings because we have this new year and it seems like a very practical new year of resources. And, and so this served both... Uh, 
socially and religiously uh, served as part of their government and part of their religious law. And it was a way of regulation that worked with the land and uh, helped teach them. But where it calls it a tithe, not a tax, th this is what's unique to me. Uh, because we read about tithing. Uh, actually, um, tithing, here's actually an article from uh, the Meridian magazine. It's uh, the Latter-day Offering of the Sons of Levi by Larry Burkdahl, March 13, 20, 20, uh, 2013. There's one section down here, and he talks about the offering of the Sons of Levi. The, the reason that interests me is because usually we pay our tithes to the bishop or the bishop's storehouse. In Doctrine and Covenants 107, 68 through 69, it says, Wherefore the office of a bishop is not equal unto it, for the office of a bishop is in administering all temporal things. Nevertheless, a bishop must be chosen from a high priesthood unless the literal descent, he is a literal descent of Aaron. The reason that was important is because in Nehemiah chapter 11, it talks about uh, the rulers of the people that dwelt at Jerusalem. Uh, in chapter 11, the people and their overseers are elected by lot, right? So everyone's qualified. It's just a matter of drawing lots of who's going to go and dwell in Jerusalem and other cities. So th this, to me, is very uh, significant. Here it, it refers to uh, those that are chief. The chief people are referred to as the bishops. It has a link over to Doctrine and Covenants. And so that was making me consider the last days and, and dwelling in Jerusalem or the rehabilitation of New Jerusalem. Because in Doctrine and Covenants, we read that it's no longer needful for the saints to inhabit uh, Jackson County, Missouri. That someday that, that, that will be the center place in the millennium. But right now it's go back to the mountains or go, go up to the mountains. The Lord will come to you there. And this, and they were given instruction that it is needful that you obtain an endowment, a blessing, of power. And this is for your middle-aged men and your young men that will go and redeem Israel and the sons of Jacob. The reason that's important is <laughs> Doctrine and Covenants uh, 109, This we, we recently heard about this. This is the prayer of the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. In verses 62 through 67, it says, We therefore ask thee to have mercy upon the children of Jacob, that Jerusalem from this hour may begin to be redeemed, and the yoke of bondage may, be to, may begin to be broken off from the house of David, and the children of Judah may begin to return to their lands, which thou didst give to Abraham, their father, and cause that the remnants of Jacob, who have been cursed and smitten because of their transgression, be converted from their wild and savage condition to the fullness of the everlasting gospel, that they may lay down their weapons of bloodshed and cease their rebellions. And may all the scattered remnants of Israel, who have been driven to the end of ends of the earth, come to a knowledge of the truth, believe in the Messiah, and be redeemed from oppression and rejoice before thee. All right. And this is in connection in Third Nephi, chapter 20, verse 29, where it says, And I will redeem the covenant which I have made with my people, and I have covenanted with them that I would gather them together in mine own due time, that I would give unto them again the land of their fathers for their inheritance which is the land of Jerusalem, which is the promised land unto them forever, saith the Father. And this is referring to Jerusalem, the last days. So not only was the building up of the actual literal city of New Jerusalem in Jackson County, Missouri, that was held at bay, and they were told to flee to the mountains, which we read in Isaiah, that all nations will flow into the mountains. And this is now being etched in on the temple for all nations to see, and they're going to be flying different nations' flags in uh, Temple Square. Um, so the saints are to go there. However, before redeeming New Jerusalem, the, the literal city 
in Jackson County or Davies County, Missouri, that this is, they must obtain their endowment. Now they go to Salt Lake, they actually come into the land uh, on the very day. The first saints that arrived came in on the very day, uh, two bit, not two bit, I'm mixing up all the days now. On the very day, Tisha B'Av, that the Jews mourn the loss of their first and second temple. On that day is when Latter-day Saints first enter the Salt Lake Valley. And then it takes 40 years, 40 years, a trial period, them in the wilderness before they can get back to receiving that endowment because Kirtland, they, they had to flee out of Kirtland. So now they had to rebuild up and, and obtain this promise which we see uh, in, in this magazine. Again, this is uh, Larry Burkdahl. When referring to the offering of the sons of Aaron, he says, the sacrifices that we offer in the temple through our serving there is part of our offering in righteousness, which the sons of Aaron, a.k.a. Levi, and the sons of Moses will present to the Lord at his coming. If the saints fail to make this offering, said the prophet Joseph Smith, it is, quote, at the peril of their own salvation, close quote. Now, what does that mean? Oh, this is talking about going to the temple and everything's going to be honky-dory. And, and that's, it's just saying you need an endowment of power. However, it, it's the, the covenant that we literally make. It, it's like we're putting our name on a title that we will have an opportunity to be a partaker with the Lord's house it's like uh, how it was said that this is the winding up scene. The winding up scene is the closeout and liquidation of a company while the company is still maintaining business as usual. However, it liquidates its assets and takes of that money and pays it back to its its uh, uh, endorsers, it, it, its uh, suppliers, its investors, so that way they, they don't take a loss. That's like this world it's the endowment is us being connected as an investor we're invested in this world we're, we're invested in overcoming this world and being one with christ so but at the same time we're also considering what about adam on diamond adam on diamond to me i like to think of as our temple endowment if you think of what Adam on Diamon actually is, it says Adam on Diamon is the subject of revelation received by Joseph Smith and recorded by the LDS Church. Um, and it, it's a spring hill named by the Lord Adam on Diamon because he, because said he, it is a place where Adam shall come to visit his people. Uh, <clears throat> and the Ancient of Days shall sit as spoken. Uh, by Daniel the prophet. Um, where was the quote about what the definition of Adam on Diamond is? It's like the land here, meaning of the name. Adam on Diamond has been speculatively translated as, quote, the valley of God where Adam dwelt, close quote. That's from a Latter-day Saint Apostle Orson Pratt. Uh, the valley of God in which Adam blessed his children, or Adam's grave, or Adam with God. Now think about it, it's supposed to be the center place. It's going to have a new capital built there. And it's because the millennium is the beginning of a new creation. Just like the Axis Mundi, the temple, the pyramid, the, 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 the mounds, the, these are symbols of a point of creation, a new beginning, a start. And it's from that point of creation which the Lord stands. It's that land which emerges out of the waters of chaos and he begins to create anew. So the whole thing about Adam on Diamond being the center place is, yes, it, it will be the center place from which all things are, are recreated for the millennium. It will be the center place, the Axis Mundi, where the temple complex will be built. So that will be done. And that is the beginning of the millennium, because that's where it emerges. Um, and it's supposed to be a political capital, so we already have existing political capitals. 
But what about inhabiting that area? Well, that brings me back to uh, Nehemiah chapter 11, where at this time, this is where people were, that connects over to here, their, their chief people are sent there to organize it. And uh, here you have, and the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people also cast lots. So the rulers, the chief people, which is the finest bishops, are sent there. And then the remaining people cast lots to determine where they will settle. And you remember President or Elder Bentnar's talk on the last wagon. And the, the history behind the last wagon is these are the last pioneers coming across. The thing is, is that once they got to Salt Lake, a lot of them were given assignments and said, okay, I need you to move and go down to San Diego. I need you to go down to Mexico. I need you to go down to the island. I'm calling you on a mission. You're going here, you're going there. It was, they got to that new place, that place of safety. And from there, they were sent out again. They went down into the world once again to settle, to habitat, to make a habitation. This is the same for us in the millennium, in my opinion, that where it says cast lots, that indicates that there's multiple people who are qualified and one or another and mattereth not, right? So they're all. It, you have your chief people where they need to be in organizing, making up, making their sacrifice, giving up their uh, offering of righteousness as sons of Aaron. Offering of righteousness are these, is our temple work according to this. Um, now, how does this connect back to, to Bishvat? To Bishvat was our offering of the trees. Now the trees brings us back to uh, uh, let's look at the tree of life since that's oh, we're basically there. Come follow me. The fruit there is that white pure fruit is Christ, the pure love of God, pure love of Christ. Uh, the iron rod is the word of God. We see all through Revelation, and we see in Isaiah. Where is it? That the iron rod, the reed, like unto a rod. This was used, Revelation chapter 11, a reed like unto a rod, and it was used to measure the temple of God, right? But th this is the word of God giving that measurement, uh, it, the, the qualifications, the, the standards, the questions. When we go to the temple, we have to be interviewed by our bishop and by our stick president. We give an accounting of our stewardship. We give a quali qualification. We have to maintain these standards and covenants which we have made with the Lord. And then when we go, we have Elder Haney who spoke at BYU and told us that the veil is a symbol of Christ. And that this is what we should recognize. This is where we should recognize Christ in the temple is the veil. Imagine going through that veil into the celestial room, sitting down in silent prayer, and then offering an accounting of your stewardship that you've given to your bishop, you've given to your state president, but now you're giving it to the Lord. Is this not similar to our Adam on Diamon? Adam on Diamon is the place where Adam dwelt. Who are we when we go to the temple? Who, who are we in similitude of? We are as our own Adam and our own Eve. We are we are going to the Axis Mundi. We, we are having that meeting. We are going to the temple. This is the return to the presence of the Lord. This is where the veil is thinnest, correct? Where heaven and earth meet is there in the celestial room. So... Let's treat the, let, let's think of an invitation to Adam on Diamond as if it were our endowment. And how are we going to have all the saints who have passed on there through our family history? How do we receive power and blessings? It's from that covenant connection relationship. We are sealed with the Lord and we have a higher law which helps us overcome all the things of the world. The issues of the world should not be issues for us if we are keeping our covenants. We should be able to overcome those easily, forgive one another, love one another. 
and stay within our our lane. We don't need to travel into the muck of the world. We're we're going over it. We're, we're rising above it. And so that's that's one of my main things I wanted to talk about. Um, let me see how much time I have left. Uh, the rest of this was going to be about Zechariah, but I got to go get the baby and I ran out of time. So this left you for now. Thank you guys.